Praise God. Again, if you're visiting us this morning, I'm so glad you're here. And if you'd like to know how to connect with our uh, weekly groups, we get together in, in groups in um, some people's houses, some family houses, and also uh, here at the church um, during this um, month of July and August. I'm leading a, a group here at the church. We have coffee and cookies, and it's every Thursday at 7 p.m., and you're more than welcome to come. Um, anybody's welcome, all ages, um, all the, anybody can come. We're studying the life of Jesus, and we're studying the gospel. We're doing the Alpha course. It's an amazing, tremendous course uh, put together by Nick Campbell over 30 years ago. It's an amazing man of God, and still very contemporary. It's an amazing course. It's used all over the world, and we, we are uh, teaching that every Thursday, 7 p.m. here at the church, Thursday, 7 p.m., Everyone is welcome. We also have other groups that are still going on. So if you want to know more, you can talk to me at the end or talk, talk to Pastor Jeff, who's in the back. And we can talk to Josh, who made the announcements here. And you can also go uh, send us an e email, uh, info at gatewaychurch.ca. Info at gatewaychurch.ca. Perhaps you can have that on the screen a little bit, just to, so that if you're new, if you're visiting, you'd like to know more. Please feel free to send us, shoot us an email and would love to connect you with the group, right? That's gatewaychurch.ca, that's our church. And there you have the email, info at gatewaychurch.ca. Amazing. So we're going to continue our series on, this is the second Sunday I'm talking about Amazing Grace. Can you say that with me? Amazing Grace. Say that again. Say that again. Amazing Grace. Right. And the word grace in Hebrew is Hen. Let's, let's, let's speak another language this morning. Some people speak French and Portuguese. We have Portuguese speakers, speakers here this morning. Hallelujah. We have French speakers here this morning. And now we're going to have Hebrew speakers here this morning, right? We're going to speak Hebrew. So say, say this with me. Say hen. hen. There you go. We just sp spoke Hebrew. And that means grace. That's the word grace in Hebrew. And hen means delightful, favorable, pleasant, a, give, a gift given with delight or favor. A gift given with delight and favor. That's the word hen, and that's what means grace. So God's grace is God being uh, delighting himself on us, showing favor to us, uh, uh, found, finding pleasure on us. He, he gives us the grace, uh, the gift of grace. And, and when you receive a gift, it's not because you deserve it. The, the word gift is not related to um, something you deserve. A salary, for example, is something you deserve. You work for it, right? There are things that you earn and you receive because you paid a price for it. But the grace of God is not a result of you earning it. Salvation in Christ Jesus is not something that we can attain by earning it. it, it no matter how hard you try to, to live a perfect life, you can never be perfect because nobody, I mean, nobody's perfect, Right? And, and there's a saying that I, I joked with the worship team this morning. Uh, I said, uh, you know, uh, practice, practice, practice. Practice makes perfect. perfect. No, it's wrong. Nobody's perfect. Practice makes improvements. That's what practice makes. But nobody's perfect. I mean, you've been practicing. If you've been married, you know what I'm talking about, right? You've been practicing being married for a while, and you're trying to make improvements. But you can never be perfect. Who has a perfect marriage? I mean... <laughs> We are working together in a relationship, be it with your boss, be it with your friend, even at church. And I think this is very important because there's some, sometimes we go through churches. Um, and uh, sometimes we change churches because we moved to another city, like me. And maybe you change the, another church because you got another job somewhere and you need to relocate. Some people change uh, churches for many reasons. But it's very important that we realize that there is no perfect church. Um, some people, especially when they get saved, they, they have this idea that, oh, I got into the church. I found this place. Maybe they may be talking. Imagine this dialogue with a friend. I found this place. What place? Oh, it's called church. Yeah? What is it about? Oh, it's this place where all oh, these wonderful, perfect people get together. <laughs> and, and they love us unconditionally. No matter what we do, they're always going to love us. And they get saved, and they're like, we get to have that, right? That passionate idea about church. And then one year goes by, and two years go by, and three years, and then it starts to have a little problem with somebody here, a little problem with somebody there. Oh, I don't agree with this Bible verse. I don't see eye, eye to eye with you here. I don't see eye to eye on this. And then sometimes when disagreement comes, because they haven't been prepared, 
Then they leave the church and say, I'm going to look for another perfect church. Like the one, the impression I had in the beginning, because this is, I found out this one is not perfect. And then they go for the second church and the third, and, the, and sometimes the second pastor and the third pastor, looking for the perfect pastor. And I'm here to, to let you know, you know, some of you already know that, realize that. But the truth is, if you're on a highway at 80 kilometers per hour, 100 kilometers per hour, let's say 110 per hour, and then you, you, suddenly there's a speed bump. What's going to happen? You're going to crash your car into that thing. But if you're driving your car on a highway, and you're 110 or 100, and suddenly there's a sign, watch out, speed bump ahead. You go, oh, speed up. Okay. Automatically, you're going to slow down. And then there's another sign, um, speed bump ahead. You're going to slow down again. And further down the road, speed bump ahead. And you go, okay, it's, it's probably close. And then you slow down again. And then there is the speed bump. You can see it because now you're slow. You can see it. So you go over it. Nice and gentle, and you don't break your car. So let me tell you, this is a speed bump, it is, and these are the warnings, these are the signs. Church is not a place filled with perfect people. It's not. Church is not a place filled with flawless people. Nobody here is flawless. But church is a place where flawed people find forgiveness. That's all it is. A place where flawed people find forgiveness. And if we start our walk in the church... And some of you are new or coming. I'm so glad that we're going to have people to baptize. And I'm so excited. It's your first uh, encounter with the church. And you start to join us. And I'm so excited about that. We're going to have baptisms. Can you say praise God for the baptisms? God. Hallelujah. And it's important for these new believers who are coming to faith now. We will be baptized to know. So we are giving the signs of warnings in this road that will be speed bumps. Okay, so go slow. Next time you make friendship with somebody in church, don't think they're like the incarnation of Jesus on the earth. Right? We are trying. We are all trying. We want to be as close to Jesus as we can. Imitators of Christ. Can I hear an amen? amen? But we are far, far from being perfect. So God in his mercy, knowing we are not perfect, he sends the one who is perfect to die on the cross for us. Hallelujah. The only one who has ever been, he could, who could all, all, ever be a perfect human being, Jesus Christ, he died on the cross for us. And, and when he did it, he not only died on the cross for us, but the Bible says that he's sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Isn't that interesting? We're going to come back to that. But now I want to share with you a text that is in Esther, chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. And I have here summarized. I want to read that together like only Gateway Church can read in, our, in the entire city of Arnhem Prior. This is the only church that reads the Bible verses like this. Okay, you ready? Let's go. So, Oh, I'm so proud of you guys. Give you guys a hand. Come on. You beautiful choir. All right, so Esther comes to the king, and now she's queen, and she's coming to the king to intercede. Repeat after me, intercede. She, Esther intercedes for her people because there has been made a decree uh, by which all the Jews should be murdered, should be executed. So she goes to intercede, and she finds grace. She finds favor. The Bible says uh, favor, and it's important that we understand favor and grace are uh, interchangeably used, or in the translation in the Bible, uh, for the word hen. So the word hen in, in, in Hebrew, which means grace and favor, is used here to, uh, to express that the king saw uh, grace and, and, and saw Esther with eyes of grace and favor, and he granted her what she was asking for. Say with me, amazing grace. So it's important that we see here, I want to I uh, uh, highlight for you that Esther was interceding for the people. Say with me, intercede. intercede. In Genesis 33, verse 8, we have another person interceding as well. Um, Genesis 33, verse 8 says, Then Esau said, What do you mean by all this company which I met? And he, which is Jacob, uh, said, "There are no. Um, these are to find favor. Say with me, favor. In the sight of my Lord. So Jacob intercedes for his people. And the story is that Jacob stole the gift or the right 
um, of the firstborn, his brother, because he was born after Esau, and he stole, he, he had his entire device to, um, um, to lie to his father, Isaac, and to convince him that he was Esau. You know, you know, if you read the story before, if you haven't, I encourage you to do Genesis 33. And so um, a few years have passed, at least 15, some say 30 years have passed, and now he's going to encounter his brother again, and he has no right to receive anything, any forgiveness from his brother. Uh, legally speaking, he's on the wrong side. Esau should treat him uh, with um, violence, perhaps, and, to, to, and perhaps even steal everything he has. But Jacob asks him for forgiveness. Jacob asks him for favor. And he finds favor in the sight of his brother. Say that, say that again with me, favor. So this is another example in the Bible of somebody asking for favor, which is an undeserved merit, undeserved gift, an under, undeserved treatment that Jacob did not deserve to be treated with favor. But because he humbled himself, because he repented, because he came before his brother, knelt down and cried, and then his brother treated him with favor. And another example is Exodus 33, verse 16. For um, how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace, say grace, grace, in your sight, except you go with us? For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So this is Moses now interceding for the people of Israel. And when you read the Bible, you see that the people of Israel, from time to time, they would mess it up. God comes with favor and love and grace and, and you know, delivers them from uh, uh, slavery Entire nation at once delivered from slavery. And Pharaoh is coming after them. And, and God delivers them from Pharaoh. And then there's the Red Sea in front of them. And God opens up the sea. And God is treating Israel with grace and favor. And, so, and the people continues The people continues to um, defy God. And they continue to sin against God. And they even build uh, an idol. After God did the ten signs in Egypt. And after God opened the sea in front of them. After all the entire enemy army is drowned in, in that sea. And they're delivered. And then after God provides for them in the desert. These people still make an idol. And they worship this, this image of a, of a cow or, or a bull that they created in, in the desert. And then God is very upset with all this. And this sin that is covering the entire nation of Israel. And then God, God says to Moses, I'm going to wipe out, this, wipe out this nation. I'm going to start a new nation from you. And Moses says, oh God, please don't do that. Now, we believe that God didn't really mean to do that. He was testing Moses' heart. Now, do, it's important that we understand that from time to time, God's going to test our heart. God's going to test our heart. God's going to test your heart. That will be trials. That will be challenges. There will be relational speed bumps. And it's important that we are prepared. And it's important that we have a humble heart. And it's important that we know how to cry out to God. And Moses intercedes for his people. Oh God, please forgive them if your presence doesn't come with us. He says, um, except you go with us. So the one, number one thing when you study the relationship with Moses and God, the number one thing uh, that, God, uh, that Moses asks God is for his presence. Moses is often constantly asking God for his presence. What are we without God's presence? What is a church without God's presence? I mean, what is a church without miracles, without signs and wonders and healings? We're just gathering together like a Lions Club. You know, it's nice, it's good. We make friends and we may have meals and chats and laughs. But where is, where is God? So God comes and manifests himself where he finds faith. Will God find faith on the earth? Will God find faith in this church? Can I hear an amen? amen. Yes, he will. And we already have been seeing God making some amazing miracles. I can see some people sitting here who already experienced God's touch and God's healing hand. And I know this is only the beginning. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. All right? So uh, what matter, the difference is God doesn't change. But what do, we, we do change. So it's important that we remain faithful. That we embrace this amazing grace, amazing grace of God. That we do not listen to the devil and all the negative voices that say, like uh, Job's wife, you know, renounce your God. He's not doing anything for you. From time to time, the enemy is going to say that to you. He's going to say, oh, your miracle is taking too long. I keep hearing about God's good, God's good, but where is my miracle? You see, cause I, I was talking to somebody this week, and um, I, uh, I was sharing with them a, a, an example, a story of a, a 
person, uh, a young lady that I met, 23 years old. My wife knows this story. She was there with me. And she came from Australia uh, with a team of people, and we were in Brazil. And suddenly I see this young woman, 23 years old, and she's crying. Everybody's happy. We were having a great time there in Brazil with this team. And then she's crying. I came to her and said, what's going on? And I knew she was the daughter of a billionaire in Australia. We're not supposed to tell that to anybody, but we knew it. So I came to her and said, what's going on? And she said, I'm depressed. Immediately, I, I judged her. And I thought, how dare you? You're the daughter of a billionaire. You don't have the right to be, to be depressed. I do. <laughs> Everybody else here does. You have everything you could ever dream of. How can you do I mean, you have boats and yachts, and God knows what you have. How can you be depressed? I thought, in a split second, I confess to you. I had to repent later. I judged her. I said, God, God I'm sorry I judged her. And, and I said, oh, what, why are you depressed? And she said, oh, I'm 23. All my best friends have uh, gotten married and had kids, and I'm 23, and I, I can't find love, and I can't find purpose in my life. And I said to her, why is that? So she says, well, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid that whoever I meet will want to marry me because of the money I have. It's hard being a billionaire, she said. I thought, hmm, I'd like to try. <laughs> But I got her point. I understood what she's saying. She's saying, how can, I, how can I know if this young man who says loves me really loves me because of who I am and not because of what I can give? And I, and I thought, you know, that's interesting. Isn't that how God feels about us? How can God know if we are looking for God, if we're seeking God for what he can do for us or for who he is? Because, see, God is a person. And just like we are, a person, individually, we, as, as, as a person, you are looking for true love. God, as a person, is looking for true love from all of us, from everyone. But how can God, being almighty, and everybody knows that he's almighty, how can he approach somebody? How can he know that person really loves him for, for who he is and not for what he can do? And I tell you, it's through the test of time. It's through the test of time as you enter a relationship with God and he doesn't do and he doesn't give and how long is our love going to last if he doesn't give how long is our love going to last if he doesn't do and then the test of time and not getting what we want is is how god can know and and sometimes god already knows because god knows all things but we don't right and it's important that we go through because we are subject to time god isn't we are subject to time so god uses time to test our faith Remember when God said to Peter, Peter, you're gonna, your faith is going to be tested. In the Bible, the Bible talks about our measure, measure of faith, how much faith you have. Faith like a mustard seed. Uh, and the disciples said to Jesus, give us more faith. So faith is not something that you either have or you don't. Faith is something that you can have in a certain measure, and it grows as you continue to have a relationship with God. Can I hear an amen? amen. And it's important that we embrace this amazing grace of God and understand that the, the, the place of the grace, the manifestation of the grace comes through intercession. Say with me, intercession. So uh, another verse I want to share with you is Romans 8, 34. Who then will condemn us? Now let me pause there and say, there's a lot of people trying. Right? The Bible says, who then will condemn us? And I tell you, there's a lot of people trying. And it's normal. In life, you're going to go through work. You're going to go through friendship. You're going to go through marriage. You're going to go through, some people go through divorce, and you're going to go through relationships, and sometimes you're not going to see eye to eye with somebody, and that person may leave that relationship with you, and they may try to condemn you, and maybe they will judge you, and maybe they'll tell others, oh, I don't like this, I don't like that, I didn't like that, I don't agree. This person has a mask on his face, and they start to say things because we are relational people. When we get together with other people, we tend to talk, Right? We don't get together to be silent. Perhaps in church. But we get together to talk. And most of the time when people get together to talk, they talk out of the overflow of their hearts. And if their heart is filled with bitterness, unforgiveness, what are they going to talk about? They're going to talk about the people that they have a problem with. And it's very important as Christians that you understand this. And remember, church is not a place of flawless people. The church is a place where flawed people find forgiveness. Should we say that together? Ch church is a place. Say, say that again. Church is not a place, not a place 
of flawless people. But a place where flawed people find forgiveness. How many of you need forgiveness this morning? Say I. We all need forgiveness because we have all fallen short of the grace of God. So it's not to, for anybody to dismay when this A, B, or C, or D ha, you know, have a conflict. But the, the question is, Jesus said, conflicts will come. Disagreement will come. Problems will come in relationships. But the Bible says, are you willing? Jesus says in Matthew 7, 7, do not judge. But sit down with the person and talk, talk it over. That's what Jesus says, Matthew chapter 7. Go, go check it out later. The Bible says, don't judge. Don't go around accusing and telling other your friends about how this A and B and D did, you know, uh, hurt you or mistreated you. That's not what we're supposed to do. The Bible says, you got a problem with somebody? That's Jesus' own words. Words in red. <laughs> you have a problem with somebody? Sit down with the person and work it out. Oh, I don't like conflict. I don't like conflict. I'm not comfortable with conflict, right? It's easier to go around telling other people about what's going on. That's not going to solve the problem. If I have a problem with Jamie, I don't, it's not going to help me if I sit down with Ken uh, or I sit down with Anna and I talk about Jamie. How, how is that going to help my problem with Jamie? I have to sit down with Jamie for my problem with Jamie. If I have a problem with A, how is talking to B going to help me solve this problem? Maybe I'm going to defame. I'm going to make his name bad, ugly. Make him, you know, look like he's, he's done something wrong and cast judgment upon him. And that's not what the Bible teaches us. That's not what Jesus teaches us. Jesus didn't tell us that we we're going to sit in the judgment seat on earth. We're not the judge. Are we the judge? We're not the judge. But we are all, we have all been. Sinners, and we all need God's grace. Say with me, amazing grace. Amazing. That's what we need. We need amazing grace. To, so who will condemn us? No one. Say, no one should. No one should. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he's sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand. Say with me, right hand. Right. And he pleads for us. Now, this is very interesting. I have an next slide for you. I want to show this. This is very interesting. Oh, I don't know if it worked. Did it work? Oh, praise God, it worked. Here we go. It didn't work on my computer. <laughs> this is the courtroom layout. You've probably seen this in movies. Maybe you have been in one. I hope you don't ever have to. But here we go. There's the judge sitting there in the throne of judgment, right? On the right hand of the judge, you have the defense. On the left hand, you have the prosecution. Let's go back to the verse once again. Who then will condemn us? No one. Say no one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting where? In the place of honor at God's? Say right hand. Let's go back again to the, to the courtroom. Look. Who sits on the right hand? Say with me. The defense. Say defense. Jesus is sitting on the defense team for you. Jesus is for you. God is not against you. He's for you. God's not pointing fingers and going, ah, ha, 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 ha. I'm going to crush you and send you to hell. <laughs> what kind of God is that? No, that's not the Bible. what the Bible tells us about God. The Bible tells that, us that God has hen. From beginning to end, from Genesis to uh, Revelation, God has hen. God has grace. In the New Testament, it's a Greek word. It's charis. Where we got the word charismata, which is the grace gifts. It's a gift of grace. You have done nothing to deserve it. You can never do anything to deserve it. You can't do a sacrifice big enough. Because no sacrifice will be bigger than the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Amen. Some cultures and some religions, they will put some offerings. Some cultures and religions will put offerings for gods. But Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is the ultimate sacrifice. Amen. And the Father is pleased with it. And it's the perfect sacrifice. We don't have to add on to it. We all have to just accept it. Yeah. You know, when you get a gift, let's say Christmas is coming and you're going to get a gift. You don't, you, know, you don't get a gift and say, oh, thank you, but you know, I, I really deserve this. That's not right. Something, you know, it's not right to say that when you get a gift. But what do you say when you get a gift? You say, thank you, and that's it. It's the same thing with salvation. 
It's the same thing with God and Jesus. All you've got to say is thank you. All you've got to do is have a, a repentful and a humble heart and say, I do not deserve it, but I take it. Thank you. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. He is sitting at the right hand of God the Father. And he's for you. He's not against you. But Pastor Ed, from time to time, I, I stumble and fall. You know, from time to time, I, 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 I fail over and over again. I'm ashamed of God. Don't ever be ashamed of God. Because the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross is enough. Amen. He cried himself, tetelestai, in Greek, which means paid in full. All that you can ever do is being paid in full. And all that you ever have to do is to accept and receive it. Accept the gift. Embrace the grace, this amazing grace of God. And just live a life that will please Him. Live a life and, and, and seek God for a deeper relationship. A deeper relationship, understanding God, Jesus Christ, is sitting at the right hand of the Father. That's the defense. That's where the defense attorney sits with the defendant. Jesus is sitting right next to you. There. That's where the defense attorney sits with the defendant. See? He sits there to defend you, not to accuse you. And if Jesus doesn't accuse you, nobody else should. Nobody else should. But Pastor Ed, I have to be honest, I failed with this person. Okay, go talk to them. Go talk to them. Be open. Be honest and say, you know what? I have unresolved issues with you, and I want to say, on, on my part, I want to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I, I failed. And that's it. And don't expect anything else. Just be humble and say it. And, and leave it. And, and, and just have peace. Right? We, we are not here to sit on the throne of judgment. But we are there as defendants. And Jesus Christ is our defense attorney. He could not ask for a better defense attorney. He could not ask for a better defense attorney. Now, embrace the, the, the free gift of grace that God has given you. Tomorrow is Monday. You're going to have an entire week ahead of you. I, I pray and hope that you li live a life to the fullness, embracing God's grace and God's favor, knowing that He's for you. He's not against you. Next time the devil comes and starts to put thoughts in your head, accusing you, you just say, hey, no, I don't, no, uh-uh, mm-mm, no. His sacrifice on the cross is enough. Is enough. And the next time he comes, you, oh, you sinner. Oh, oops, you did it again. <laughs> next time he does that, he say, no, shh, ah, quiet. I'm not taking any of that. Jesus is my defense attorney. He is the one who paid for the price on the cross for me. I just embrace the free gift of, of grace. Amen. In Jesus' name. Can I hear an amen? amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's stand up. Let's stand up and let's pray. Father God, we thank you. Can I have the worship team? We're going to sing that Build My Life once again. Father God, we thank you. We praise you for who you are. Thank you for the amazing grace and the love you have loved us with. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, that you are sitting at the right hand of the Father. You are our defense attorney. And just like Esther interceded for the people, just like Jacob interceded for his people, just like um, Moses interceded for the people of Israel, you also intercede for us. It's your intercession. It's your intercession. You're crying out to the Father in our behalf. And, and the price has already been paid. And, and when the enemy points his finger at us, hallelujah, Jesus, you show God your wrists and the marks of the nails that mark those wrists. And the Father says, it's enough. It's enough. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, we praise you, God. We praise you and we thank you for this amazing grace.